so last week, and we, um, we go through and the, the MEG forward and the inverse modeling techniques. And uh, uh, so today, let's, let's finish that topic and then we're going to cover another topic, which is the MEG application to clinical uh, population uh, with a focus on epilepsy and uh, brain tumor for the functional mapping. So let me see, last time we, we left over was uh, the L2 minimum norm um, solution. I'm gonna start from here. So yeah, we know, you know, the uh, when we divide a pre-divided entire brain into, a, you know, um, a few hundred thousand, Voxel and will assign each voxel an electric current dipole. Uh, in this case, we, we know the location of the source. They're prefixed over there, right? For each voxel. So we can pre-calculate the MEG forward models and predict for each location the MEG fuel pattern uh, at the sensor domain. And the the, the problem is, you know, on the uh, the the uh, the system become underdetermined. There's so many unknown variables, we only have three three hundred six sensors. So to, the solution in, intrinsically does not have unique solution. So to make solution unique, we need to introduce additional constraint. No, you know, the L two minimum norm solution is the one actually the most straightforward one, and uh, which is we not only feeding the data prediction versus measurements, minimize this one alone is not sufficient. You have too many, by too many unknown variables, the number of measurements. So we introduce additional constraint, which is the one that minimizes the total power or L2 minimum norm. If you accept this additional constraint, then the solution becomes quite straightforward. Just one line of MATLAB code. I mentioned this one was first introduced as the more Penrose inverse. And the second author is the Rogers panel with Nobel Prize 2020. Of course, not because of this contribution, but because his major contribution to and to uh, general relativity and prediction to black hole and the and the creation of the universe, uh, but but still, you know, this is one of his you know small contributions. You know, we still use this one. If you accept this one, the L two minimal solution is very straightforward. But the I mentioned this example shown by this paper from Anders Dale and Eric Hogren, the intrinsic resolution of L two minimum norm is limited. Is give it a big patch, you know. In some, in many cases, that's that's uh, sufficient. But in case of, uh, for example, you know, pre-surgical mapping, you will know precisely hey, where is the broken area. Uh, low resolution L2 minimum norm might not be the ideal solution. So now, today we're gonna go forward looking at additional, you know, separate constraint, you know. So of course, we're gonna minimize our prediction from the measurements. The first term stays the same, but instead of minimize the total power which is the QI summation score, we're going to look at the summation of QI absolute value, the, which is called the L, L1 minimum norm, just the first power, okay? If you accept this, this mathematic constraint, the solution becomes sparse. We're going to show you some of the nice development. Of course, you're going to stay with other things, you know, and then also you know, explore the max entropy and give some prior this topic for, for different days. So uh, let's stay with the L1 minimum norm solution. The R1 norm solution is, uh, is way more complicated than the L2 norm solution, which is one line in MATLAB code. This L1 norm solution, uh, you probably need thousands of code, you know, and uh, so, and also the conventional R1 norm solution have intrinsic issue with, as I call it, spiky or discontinuity between one time point and second time point, because that's, very sensitive to a little bit noise, you know, in, in the data. So the the reconstructed source time courses are are spiky. All the the, the activity is a jump from one location to the nearby neighborhood, you know. So to overcome this problem, we develop you know the Vesto, which is spatial temporal analysis using our minimum norm. In this case, I show the result. We can have a very high you know spatial resolution and or maintain the one millisecond temporal resolution. Uh, in, in this case, we can because we, we do not introduce additional constraint in the time domain, we can handle anything from uh, totally uncorrelated sources to something 100% correlated sources. So here's some, the math be, behind the, the spatial temporal L1 norm or Westall solution. So for each time, time point, 
we solve a L1 norm solution. So we, we get, you know, D of T at a given time, so things are spiking, you know, discontinuous. And then we take this MEG sensor matrix, we decompose that one using the single value decomposition into a sensor spatial feature, which is UB, and the time signature feature, which is VB, transpose over there. And then we use the time signature in a sensor and waveform, construct a projection matrix in a P parallel. And we project the traditional L1 norm through this, uh, this, uh, you know, this projection operator. By doing that, the force, the time signature in source time courses actually is this identical to the time signature in a sensor domain. So by doing that, we, we effectively get rid of those unsmoothness and the, the spiky signature. I'll show you example in the uh, next slide. Here's examples we apply this uh, in the, the Vestal solution on the human data set. This is actually median nerve uh, semi-sensory response. We know, and you know, we try to show you that MEG with the Vestal give you not only one millisecond temporal resolution, but two to three millimeter resolution in space. So if you are familiar with the human semi-sensory system, which is the one the figure on the right hand side, that's a you know picture copied from the you know the principal neuroscience by Kendall Short, the Bible of neuroscience, basically. Yeah, and the chapter talk about the human uh, semi-sensory system. My shock the, the median nerve, in this case, the left median nerve, and the signal propagates through spinal cord, reaches the thalamus. And then from the 20 millisecond later after the shock, they project the signal to this area called Borman ER 3B. If you look at the this figure, the one highlight is the central sulcus. The, the ER 3B is a posterior band of the central sulcus. ER 3 Air one, air two, combined together, co are considered to be primary semicentral cortex. But reach the air three, three B first, and based upon a textbook, signal will, will, will travel, you know, relay to air one, air two, and then posteriorly to form air five, and then air one, two, three, the link together to propagate the signal to another region called the secondary central cortex. Physically, this S two area is at the bottom of the central sulcus, like, like, a, like a ring shape, okay? So we know this information travel from 3B, 1, 2, 5, and then the uh, Bormann error 2. But the problem is if you look at the reference in this chapter, we gain most of the information through animal research, you know, invasive, you know, from, uh, you know, monkeys and non-human primate. And now let's take a look non-invasively. Can we get this information from MEG? Let me play the video. You can see uh, signal start with error 3B and error 1, error 2, error 5, later on end up in S2 area, which is exactly predicted by the by textbook. But now you get the same information non-invasively with MEG. And so if you look at the snapshot, you can see the clarity. And in the beginning, we had the signal goes to error 3B. And then when time progress, I say at 60 millisecond, the strongest signal no longer 3B is the gyrate posterior, and uh, we'll call it Borman error two. And then Borman error five and seven start to light up. And by 90 millisecond or 80 millisecond, the secondary central cortex, which is the ring at the end of central sulcus, the S2 area light up. Here we superimpose the MEG activity into the anatomy, which is the, you know, the, the gray background. That's the brain anatomy. But, and you know, this doesn't look like a, regular brain because for regular brain you can only see the activity on the on the top of the, the gyri but activity in embedded in the sulcus is invisible. Here we use you know a program called the you know and the uh, free server inflated brain and then we superimpose the, the vessel solution which is the hot spot on top of the, the free server anatomy. Now you can see the whole picture you know but from my era one era two the separate from Borman 3B just physically a few millimeter, you know, but no problem. You know, Vestal can resolve this activity very nicely. So now you, hopefully you can complete, you know, and appreciate the very high temporal spatial resolution of the Vestal compared with, for example, you know, the L2 million more. Okay. The, the comparison, you know, and the, 
is quite obvious. And uh, so the you know in this case you know and uh, we can also look at the you know the each source the source time courses, and the upper left is the one the spiky solution from the traditional R one minimum norm, and which is A figure A. Figure B is the one after the vast vestal I mean the, the vestal projection. You see, I think it's the most out. And you can you obtain a specific source. Look at the time courses of the source change function of time. For primary error 3B, you get spiky transient response, but later on they're flat. In contrast, the secondary sexual cortex, like E, S2, you can at the beginning pretty much flat, but around the 80, 90 milliseconds, you have the first peak, you know, which are consistent with the uh, snapshot you see in the previous you know, figure. So now you got the whole picture, you know, and uh, non-invasively and on living human being. And so the summary, the vestal is a spatial temporal element norm that overcome the, the low resolution from the L2 norm. And also overcome the traditional L1 norm solution that the things become spiky in the L1 norm. Now, you know, vestal solution, the things actually smooth out as smooth as sensor waveform. We can handle sources, you know, uh, from a, no correlated to 100% correlated sources. And uh, uh, the, the solution is way more complicated, the L2 minimum norm, and it involves an L1 minimum solver, which was the part of the package uh, we developed. And also later on in 2014, we actually make further improvement, speed up the, com the computation of the, the Vestal, now called the Fast Vestal. And, and that will make comparison between the Fast Vestal Another very popular MEG source modeling technique called a beamformer. Beamformer is not a very popular MEG and the source of imaging approach. Uh, I made a specific assumption. If there's many sources in the brain, if their source time courses are uncorrelated, that's very, very key point, uncorrelated, then you can perform the beamformer approach by seeking a way that, you know, for each location of the source, um, w. And the W was designed to minimize the source um, signal variance. C is the sensor a covariant matrix. You multiply by W and, and W transpose, you're looking at this, uh, the, the source, uh, you know, and the source strength variance, basically, subject to the constraint that W and the lead field matrix are perpendicular. And they only show that, that there will be one at the location where the sources are, try to suppress the activity in the surrounding, you know, in the neighborhood. And so L is called a lead field matrix, you know, and the, that means for a fixed location, you compute the MEG, you know, and the forward model to get the source, you know, an activity in a central domain for unit source foot over there. So the beam is just, it's not a, the beam in a traditional way, like a, 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 shoot, a flashlight. It's like a beam, like a cone shape. You can imagine the MEG sensor close to the source of a stronger signal, that's stronger in the beam, you know, anything far away, the activity drop out one of our sport, right? So you guys think about a beam, you know, like, like a cone shape, you know? So by using this beam, as like scanning through each location of the brain. When you accept this kind of beamform hypothesis, these things are uncorrelated, you can solve the problem very easily, which is solution over here at the bottom. And also just one line of code, coding in meta, pretty straightforward. But let's look at the performance of the, the beamformer compared with the first vessel I, I just mentioned. Here's the, the paper we published with a show example. We'll put six sources, you know, the upper left, the, the red dot are the ground truth location. We will assign each source correlated and source time courses show over here. And then we, we, we predict the MEG sensor waveform and we add different noise level. So different row over here are different noise level. And then for the second column is a reconstructed source time course using fast Vestal. And, and the third column is using the standard, you know, Vestal which is a little bit slower. The last column is the, the beamformer reconstructed sources and yeah, source waveform. When we have almost zero noise, the, the fast vestal reconstruct source time course mesh and the top gold standard almost exactly. But even with almost no noise, 
the source waveform constructed from beamformer are distorted. You can see from the cor correlation matrix, you know, the figure A is the, the ground truth to some correlation between the, the different source time courses. And B and C are the constructed, you know, correlation matrix from the fast vessel and traditional vessel that match the ground truth almost exactly. But even with almost no noise, the beamformer one is not the same because they assume the source has to be uncorrelated. You can see, you know, the totally, you know, ignore the partial correlation there. So we, of course, we add more noise, the performance of the fast vessel and traditional vessel holding up very well, even very, very noisy condition. They can still reconstruct the source time course very well, already. And the beamformer solution keep, you know, having this distorted source time courses. That's the time signature and messed up. Also in space, here's with, with the analysis in space, you know, again, the, the top uh, left is the ground truth, and then we reconstruct it with the fast vessel, uh, traditional vessel beam forming at those locations. And for the fast vessels, traditional vessel, we re regain this one almost exactly. Even with minimum noise, the beam former, well, you can get a solution, but they also have source leaking. The red area means there's a significant activity there, not supposed to be anything there, right? But the, because beam forming, we we partially violated the hypothesis source has to be uncorrelated. So the constructed, you know, beam forming location have a source leakage over there. And uh, and, and in the real case, this again as a different subjects with the you know median nerve, you can you can see this will construct sources from the uh, go to the primary sensory cortex, the red arrow, and also the bilateral secondary sensory cortex, the blue, green, and the purple. So we have the solution match the neurophysiology very well. Already the beam former solution, uh, you can get some somehow the primary source, but the secondary sensory cortex is, is almost invisible. Okay. Now that's that's the previous one is the evoke semi-sensory you know median nerve test. How about the resting state? The resting state actually is very interesting because the first recording in, of the you know, brain electro neurophysiology recording was done in exactly in uh, 100 years ago in 1924 by the German physiologist Hans Berger. He used an EEG lab to put somewhere in the parietal lobe. And when he, you know, do the recording, reject those other noise, he realized, hey, there's a that's nice 10 hertz oscillation. So the top trail is the first alpha recording called alpha wave, the name alpha wave, 10 hertz. And the bottom one is the standard, you know, sine and cosine wave. So this 10 hertz burst is first recording, hey, the brain signal is electric magnetic, you know, an electric signal. After many, many years, you know, the um the father, you know, of uh, MEG, you know, David Cohen recorded the first alpha wave using, you know, the squid sensor at MIT. But across many years, we roughly didn't know where the source come the, the brain resting stage rhythm come from, you know, that's a different rhythm, alpha, beta, gamma, you know, delta, so on, you know. So, but through different isolated cases, typically the one with uh, need brain surgery, people put, you know, the industrial grid, you know, on top of the, you know, the cortex recorded partially where they say the alpha wave generation. So we know roughly the alpha wave strong in the occipital region and parietal region, and also there's two hotspots around central sulcus called the mu rhythm. And, but this is only partial information. So in in, 20, in, in the um, in twenty fourteen, this is probably you know no longer impressive anymore. And that's the we believe the first recording covered the whole brain, the sources of the human uh, resting stage rhythm that you know ever produced. And of course, you know with, with MEG. So the top one is about ten hertz. You can see you know the the generation is mainly from the primary sensory, uh, primary visual cortex, and also secondary visual cortices, they even gap over there. And from cuneus, precuneus, also two hot spots over there, that, that are the primary sensory and motor cortex, also called the neurorhythm. That match the partial information we, we get from the surgical patient, you know, invasive, you know, recording with the electrical grid on the cortex, we match their knowledge very well. Now we have millimeter by millimeter you know, resolution, you know, precision, you know, of this one. Of course, you know, now we have a many subjects together, 41 health subject. We need to smooth out the MEG, you know, sources, you know, with the Gaussian kernel. 
to smooth out the intrasubject variability. But even after smoothing, you know, you can see the, you know, they appreciate the generation of the alpha wave. Beta one is fitting to the 30 hertz. And gamma is something of interest. Gamma actually you see quite different from alpha. There's almost minimum energy in the back part of the head of the region. Instead, there's a lot of energy and the high frequency gamma band 30 to, 30 to 80 hertz, mainly the prefrontal cortex. So a lot has developed some powerful tool for making you know diagnosis of patients with moderate traumatic brain injury, MTBI, and post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a topic for next week. But you know, now we can get a whole picture of the you know, the, the localization of the brain rhythm and using MEG non-invasively. Well, this is this is the same data set, but reconstruct it with beamformer. Well, what can I say? Look like trash to me. So the reason is because beamformer assumes sources are uncorrelated. In the case of brain rhythm, those activities are highly correlated because the brain, when the different brain area want to work together to achieve specific goal, you know, those network intrinsically have potentially high correlation. They are firing up and down the same fashion. You assume sources are uncorrelated, you get something like that. Okay. So that's the evidence the I mean the, the fast vast style approach substantially better than being former. So in summary, the beamformer assumes sources are uncorrelated. They suffer distortion, you contract source time courses, also have, have mislocalized, you know, correlated sources have severe signal leaking or fast vast style overcome all those problems. You can you can construct you can and uh, does not impose any constraint in the, in the source time courses, does not suffer distortion in source time courses. You can handle from uncorrelated to 100% correlated sources that does not suffer from signal leaking. So we overcome all this problem with the beam framework using fast less stuff. Now let's switch to another topic for and, uh, um, the MEG for clinical application and for epilepsy and pre-surgical mapping. And epilepsy is one of the major MEG application in, in for the clinical population and the patient with epilepsy. Now I'm gonna see, i play this one. MEG or MEG stands for MEG. How about now? Do you have that sound? Yes, it works. Okay, Thanks. great. Let me play. Magnetoencephalography. MEG is a method for recording brain waves and figuring out what part of the brain they are coming from. You may know about electroencephalography or EEG, or perhaps you have had an EEG test done. EEG is carried out by pasting metal electrodes on the scalp and it records much of the same brain activity that MEG does by sensing the electrical currents generated by the brain cells. The difference is that MEG picks up the brain activity by sensing the tiny magnetic fields that are generated when electrical currents move through the brain. Therefore, the brain waves are detected by hundreds of tiny little coils that line the inside of a specially designed helmet. EEG using 20 to 30 electrodes attached to the scalp is also recorded simultaneously with the MEG signals. MEG is capable of recording brainwave activity with a higher resolution than scalp EEG for two reasons. First, within the special helmet are 306 magnetic sensors, more than 10 times the number of EEG electrodes ordinarily applied. Secondly, MEG signals are unaffected by the layers in the head that they must pass through in order to reach the outside surface. EEG signals are markedly distorted, reduced, and smeared out by the layers of fluid, skull, and scalp that separate the brain activity from the surface. Not so for MEG signals. Because of these two advantages, it is possible to more accurately locate the precise location of any activity recorded during the MEG test. This improved source localization, as we call it, is especially important in the case of abnormal brainwave activities, such as those that occur in patients with epilepsy, because we do not know in advance where these abnormal discharges arise from. Like EEG, MEG can record both normal and abnormal brain signals. You will lie comfortably on a bed for about an hour while we record the MEG signals from your brain. If there are any abnormal signals that occur during the MEG recording, the processing that is done during the analysis phase after you leave the MEG lab will be able to identify what part of the brain is responsible for creating those abnormal signals. It is often useful to record the brain's MEG response to normal tasks, such as listening to sounds or words, 
viewing items or patterns on the screen, feeling a sensation in your arms or legs. That way, that part of your brain that helps you normally perceive your environment can be identified and it can be compared with any of the parts of your brain that are not functioning normally. The MEG examination is carried out in a shielded room in order to prevent outside interference from contaminating the measurement of your brain's MEG signal. Inside the room, the MEG machine consists of a special magnetic listening device which can measure you either lying down or in a chair. The device emits no energy of any kind, no magnetic fields, no x-rays, no radiation, and no electricity. You simply lie down, position your head into the MEG helmet, which is an upside down bowl sort of like the large hair dryers that they have at salons, and you try to stay as still as you can. That is all there is to it. Most patients find it is so peaceful that they actually fall asleep. In preparation for the MEG, we first attach a number of EEG and other tiny sensors to your head in exactly the manner that EEG electrodes are normally attached. Next, we measure your head and the position of several of the attached sensors with a kind of computerized magic wand as seen here. Before you go into the shielded room, we make sure that you do not have any magnetization on or in your body so that only the brain's magnetic field will be measured. Therefore, any metallic items such as jewelry, clothing with snaps or buckles, bras with metal wires, eyeglasses, etc. will have to be removed. While you are in the shielded room alone or with a parent and caregiver for those who need some reassurance or comforting, we will be in constant communication with you by intercom and we can see you on a TV monitor at all times. We constantly check your position in the MEG machine, that is, how far into the upside down bowl you actually are, to ensure that you're getting a good recording. Most patients simply remain still and end up drifting off to sleep during the quiet part of the recording. For many patients, there will also be a short active part of the recording where you will be asked to listen to earphones or to feel a stimulus. At the conclusion of the recording, you will come out of the shielded room and change back into your regular clothes. We will remove the extra sensors that were attached to your head and you're all finished. After you leave the MEG laboratory, there will be many hours spent analyzing your MEG recordings. For epilepsy patients, the results can be used to guide surgery, either by indicating the location of abnormal brain tissue that should be removed in order to eliminate seizures, or by suggesting the locations inside your head where intracranial electrodes, such as subdural grids or stereo EEG electrodes, would be best positioned to record important information. For patients with other disorders, the MEG may be used to pinpoint the location of important normal functions in order to tell the surgeon where not to remove brain tissue. If you have any questions or concern about your upcoming MEG exam, please feel free to ask your nurse or your doctor. We will, of course, explain everything to you when you arrive and throughout the test. Okay, yeah, so, so here's the one example, you know, a patient with epilepsy, you know, so for patients with epilepsy, you know, Dr. Uh, uh, Richard Burgess mentioned that, you know, we recorded, you know, the the, uh, the performance recording with patient come over here, take a nap. Why? Because, uh, you know, we want to be, to, them to be on their typical uh, you know, seizure medication. We don't push them to have a seizure inside the scanner, MG scanner. Uh, but about 10% of the cases, they, they have a seizure in the scanner, but we're not pushing for that. So they are on the regular seizure control medication, but we increase the likelihood to detect those MEG discharge, we call it interactive spike. That's a discharge between the seizure, right? The brain is, even between seizures, not silent. Sometimes generate those very, very sharp discharge, like thunderstorm in the brain, you know, and here's an example of the, you know, the left temporal MEG, the, sh the sharp, you know, discharge. And the duration of this uh, spike goes from something like a, a 15, 20 millisecond to something like 60 millisecond. So this is strong and also very sharp. And you can also capture with, it, with bipolar EEG, you know, that this particular case, both MEG and EEG show those, uh, and those discharge. But difference over there is MEG, we can accurately localize the location of the discharge, or EEG, you cannot. You, you get maybe a maybe a few centimeter error for EEG or MEG. The localization error about two to three millimeters. So it's, it's substantially better in MEG than EEG. Well, for epilepsy, one of the mechanism is the you know the 
inhibitory GABAergic interneurons are not fully functioning. In the case in one of the model for epilepsy, when there's a discharge generated by, by some damage, you know, in the primitive cell, usually when there's a strong inhibitory interneuron, the, the inhibition will suppress the firing, so confine the, the localization of the, uh, the discharge. But in the case of uh, epilepsy, that kind of mechanism is weak or, or, you know, or totally damaged. So when there's a, you know, strong firing from the part of the brain, as a propagate wider and wider. Part of the reason because of the lack of inhibitory, you know, GABAergic, you know, interneuron to suppress that one to control that. And so here's an example with what we had at that time. We have a, only the 122 MEG channels in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Here's an example with the patient with temporal lobe epilepsy. Each discharge, you can look for that, that one and superimpose on the MR. That's a one red dot. During, say, you know, one hour and a half, you know, 90 minutes recording, we might have many of those discharges. So you, we end up with multiple of those, those, uh, those uh, red dots. And uh, Here's an example was the uh, same patient, you know, in 1997, come to our site. We have a lot of, uh, you know, spike localized, you know, from the mesial temporal lobe. And the patient at that time decided to postpone the surgery, try to control the medication. But, you know, the medication, you know, uh, was not able to fully control the seizure. So in 1999, come back to us for follow-up before the true surgery, you know, that time, the uh, spike is less because there's medication control, but it's still from the same similar location. You know, with that information from surgery, and uh, the patient was seizure free after that. Well, yeah, another you know an example is that this patient you know was the um, have a very uh, very young kid you know with the epilepsy you know due to the you know yeah as the at the very early stage, you know, his brain genuine seizure, you know, to control the seizure, they're doing this called hemi hemispherectomy, which is to remove a large amount of tissue in the brain. You can see, it, you know, a lot of tissue are removed. So his seizures are only partially under control. And, uh, uh, but, you know, as, you know, because I still have seizure, so, you know, he come back, prepare for second surgery. The before the first surgery, does not have MEG, but before the second surgery, you know, we put him in the MEG, we localize the, the seizure force at the spike, come from the remaining tissue in, in this uh, abnormal hemisphere. Based on that information, in neurosurgery performed second surgery, he's seizure free. There's a follow up on this, this kid. Follow up was done with his middle school uh, students. You will imagine, but for damage this, you know, this large, he must have a huge deficit. Well, you'd be surprised because you know brain is very plastic that age, you know, and uh, so when I have follow up with you know middle school students, his like B plus students, if you talk to him, a little bit slow, but you know, it's look like a normal you know functioning kid. So uh, a lot of the brain, the functional reorganization, reorganization of the neuroplasticity, the brain can recover or regain a lot of functions. So that's a good example. And of MEG can help, you know, and uh, for this kid with epilepsy. Another one is the severe head trauma, also a leading cause for epilepsy. This case, you can see, you know, the top part, you know, there's a tissue damage, you know, in the in the T1 and from the temp anterior temporal lobe. And this same region also generate, you know, on the uh, uh, MEG, you know, on the spikes. The spike co-localized the same area with, with suffer, you know, brain damage. Yeah, but in many cases, the brain looks normal, you know, and uh, so, you know, we, um, we you know, the, the MEG become, you know, gold standard in surgical preparation in a non-invasive basis, at least. Here's example of patient with a, and the temporal lobe uh, sclerosis. You can see the shrinking of the hippocampus from the upper uh, left corner. And the red dot is the one uh, superimposed on T1 with the image go to the, the, the uh, uh, hippocampus. And this patient, you know, performs surgery seizure free. Well, another topic that we'll talk about, you know, is patient with brain tumor. You know, brain tumor, usually, you know, you see the tumor with an anatomical imaging CT or MRI, right? But that's not the whole story. Before this, in, during the surgery or before the surgery, neurosurgeon want to know, hey, how close is the tumor respect to the major functional center? In this case, 
into the primary motor cortex. You may cut a tumor, but you, if your planning is, is not careful, you may damage the viable tissue that control the body movement or control the language. The result will be devastating, right? So to try to localize the major functional center on a superimposed up on, on the anatomical imaging. So that, that's crucial for, for surgical planning. And here's an example was the um, median nerve, which is the red dot, uh, I'm sorry, the green dot, and on posterior bank central sulcus, this patient also had tumor in the primary motor cortex. The red one is the finger movement, and also do the tibial nerve central cortex. So you can map out those ones with MEG. When you superimpose the MEG functional information, the dot on the anatomy, that enhances the likelihood of a um, good outcome after surgery, not damaging this variable functional center. Here's an example, you know, patient with a cavernous angioma. This patient was denied surgery three times. The reason is because the, the location of the tumor is ugly. It's a, in the center of primary motor cortex, you know, right over there. So the neurosurgeon denies this patient surgery three times. And uh, when we, before, the, you know, not now we, we pre place the, the patient on the MEG. Now we realize the primary motor cortex localization, the red dot, actually is outside the brain, the, the tumor area. And uh, so a neurosurgeon, based on our information, decide the ghost and the you know to approach the tumor from upper and the anterior end, not damage those very variable tissue. And so the 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 red cross is the location of the same primary motor cortex during this operation. Of course, when you open the skull, the brain deform, but the, the general location of the change is a posterior side of the tumor. If the patient tumor is removed and, uh, you know, and the, with no visible, you know, and uh, weakness in the, in, the, in, in the primary motor function. So this is a very nice story. The MEG function information in conjunction with the anatomical imaging, in this case MR, provide a good story for uh, brain, uh, brain tumor patient for the, uh, you know, surgical planning. And we can also, you know, localize, you know, multiple regions like the somatocentry, homunculus, localize the, the lips area and uh, the hand area in green and the, the lap area in yellow. And uh, this is a patient with giant brain tumor. So we, we, can, we can superimpose function information on the anatomy. So um, now I'll we'll spend some time, you know, local to the, see a, pa a paper we just published. And this paper actually highlight a, a brand new approach. A brand new approach is we, we're gonna we're gonna project MEG signal towards the muscle electric activity, the EMG recording, and to drastically improve you know the localization accuracy and also shorten the time for patients with brain tumor with weak motor function. Localized primary motor function has been challenging in the past. Typically require the patient move their finger you know many 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 hundreds of times. You know recording can last about you know. 20 minutes, some patients just cannot do that, you know, because the, the motor function is weak. They have tumor actually over there, you know, affect their, their motor function. I ask them to do repetitive, large displacement, finger movement, it's just truly difficult. So, but we figure out, hey, oh, why? If we can record the, the muscle electric activity, the EMG signal, we can project the MEG towards the subspace expanded by the EMG recording. And by doing that, we can, it can drastically reduce the recording time from something like 20 minutes to something like less than one minute, one minute. In many subjects, just use five seconds of recording finger movement. You can precisely localize primary motor cortex. That never happened before in literature, you know. And we also look at a different frequency band, low frequency delta and theta, alpha and beta, and high frequency gamma to see at what frequency the finger, the, the finger, you know, movement activity the brain communicate with the muscle. So here's the example, you know, healthy control subjects, the top left bar is the EMG recording. And if you do the spectrum analysis, you can see there's a, there's a peak around one hertz. That's, the, that's you know, the, the finger movement, right? uh, move the finger about once every second, the finger flexing and extension. In this particular subject, we look at the, the delta, you know, band, which is one to four hertz. The green arrow indicate the primary motor cortex that they use one minute recording. One minute recording, a precise localization, primary motor cortex. And the left hand, 
and and, and right hand, and and also in this case, you know, we also have this uh, uh, right index finger, left index finger. But what a one minute does much better than twenty minutes, right? But what if if I push the envelope even harder, about thirty seconds? Well, no problem. Thirty seconds, you can still localize the primary motor cortex. About twenty seconds, twenty seconds still good. About five seconds. Show you in the bottom in the in in the bottom left. Five seconds recording, we can still see reliably the primary motor cortex. That's the left index finger on the lower right. So it's five seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, the primary motor cortex from the right index finger. So in this healthy control subject, even with five seconds recording, you can localize primary motor cortex. This is a little miracle because in the past, nobody had been able to do that with functional imaging. You know, and uh, so we did that by combination with MEG and the EMG. And here's the different and uh, different subjects. You know, we look at the delta band, and we can localize all the delta frequency one to four hertz. Reliable localization primary motor cortex, and also for the um, left and right index finger for all the subjects over here. And theta band, which is of great interest for us, four to seven hertz. We also get almost 100 percent you know, at, you know uh, localization successful rate for all those healthy control subjects in the in left uh, finger left and the right finger left for all the subjects and on the four to seven hertz but not in the data in the in alpha band which are not in the the dominant frequency in the brain I mentioned 10 hertz right the Hansberger and the first recording MEG EG is 10 hertz but unfortunately the brain didn't communicate to actually use the dominant frequency 10 hertz. Instead, the brain goes even higher into the beta band between the, the 30 hertz. In this case, we have a reasonable successful rate. Some subject with beta band didn't show reliable localization, but you know, we get something like a, about, about 80 some percent. And we get you know the good localization with the beta band. But not in the higher frequency gamma band. Then we, we have zero um, success in high frequency gamma band. So we now, now we know the brain communicate with the muscle, not using alpha, not using gamma, but uh, for beta, it's okay. The most effective is the theta and the other range. And that actually is, you know, is some new information we learned from the study. The brain communicate with the muscle at, you know, theta band four to seven hertz and the other band one to four hertz. So we applied this one to patient with the, and the uh, uh, brain tumor, giant brain tumor, three of them. And we see that their EMG recording, the, the spectrum, you can see, you know, for patient number one, and you can see that you know, the pink arrow indicate the location of the tumor and the hotspot over there. And as the MEG localization, primary motor cortex, right outside the tumor, you know, very informative. There's another patient with tumor, you know, and, uh, and again, MEG localization, and the, and the primary motor cortex anterior to the tumor boundary. There's a third one, a giant tumor over there. The primary motor cortex localized to the posterior boundary of the tumor. And again, very informative. So the case after case, you know, not only for, for the hand, but also have a highly successful rate for the foot. Basically, about the project MEG to the, the muscle activity, EMG recording of the foot muscle, you can also do the same thing. So, the the conclusion now with, with the EMG projected MEG source imaging, we can drastically shrink down the re recording time from twenty some minutes and uh, twenty minutes or something less than one minute. In many cases, healthy control you can get five seconds in self pace in a finger movement and uh, localization is accurate and uh, and so you know in three cases of the brain tumor, even though their the motor activity is non regular, but no problem MEG. Project, you know, through the EEG subspace, we can localize the primary motor cortex in those patients accurately. And sometimes we, we combine MEG with another imaging technology called a diffusion tensor imaging. We know MEG is a, at the very first lecture, and the MEG signal from gray matter neurons. So MEG is insensitive to what happened in the white matter. But white matter is a fiber, right? You know, during the surgery, you want to preserve the gray matter area that MEG detected, but you also need to be very careful not to damage the fiber 
uh, lead to the, the MEG, you know, signal, namely the white matter fiber. Here's, a, you know, the uh, two examples, you know, we localized the MEG activity in the primary central cortex and the well, foot, hand and the foot, the, the green one and the, and the red one, but it's not the whole story. Want to know, hey, where's the white matter fiber goes? To do that, we combine the MEG with another structural imaging technology called diffusion tensor imaging that measure how good the water molecule travel around different tissue type. In the white matter, the water travel a lot easier around the direction of white matter fiber, much difficult travel in the direction perpendicular to the fiber. Like the straw you use to drink is soda, right? The, the soda move a lot easier around the direction of the straw, but very difficult perpendicular to, to the straw. Same thing over here. Use that information, we can get image of the fiber location of, the, of white matter and also the, the orientation of white matter fiber. So in this case, we take the seed voxel from the MEG, we let the DTI grow, but figure, hey, what muscle group, what fiber, fiber group actually come that, that connect to the functional imaging, the seed voxel provided by MEG. So for the hand and the foot, uh, some sensory area, now we grow the fiber, give me the fiber track, you know, and the red and, the, and also blue. So the neurosurgeon not only should avoid the area, you know, the, the green and the red dot in the two slides before, but also try, had to avoid those fibers that lead to those functional areas. So the combination of MEG and DTI, we get a whole picture. Language. Language is so important for, for a human being. And uh, yeah, here's examples, you know, we use the dichotic listening to determine which hemisphere of the brain control the language. So in this case, you can the dichotic just the two words delivered simultaneously to the left and right ear. You know, you can determine the two words are, you know, have the meaning related or not. And in contrast, we also we can control study just delivered pure tone, one kilohertz pure tone with no linguistic information. So the wide sensor, you know, the time courses are the one with a pure tone. You can see this transient response for 100 milliseconds and then flat out. The dry one, Stephen, dry one was that dichotic word listening with linguistic information. You can tell in this case, the left hemisphere one does peak, you know, from 300 to the 800 millisecond, the substantially higher in the left hemisphere. The right hemisphere, pretty much the same in the 300 to 800 millisecond time window. This is a clear case of the left hemisphere dominant, basically, you know, in the case of uh, people are right-handed, here's the uh, statistics, 88, almost 90% of right-handed, you know, people are left hemisphere dominant. That's about 6% of right-handed person. Yes, yeah, both hemisphere contribute to language. That's 6%, you know, is right hemisphere dominant. But the top, almost 90% people, you know, right-handed, they use the long, left hemisphere for language. That's why Broca, come out his very famous saying and the statement, we humans speak with our left hemisphere. Well, for lefty, story change. You can see for lefty, that's still 60%, their uh, hemisphere, dominant language goes to the left, but there's 10% bilateral, 30% lefty, the right hemisphere control the language, okay. Well, we can also localize the two area for language comprehension, so-called uh, Wernicke's area, which is shown on the top row. And also there's another area that the hair cross indicate that's the, you know, the language production area called Broca's area. This is the case, you know, it's a more traditional approach. We had to sub-select a channel, you know, do the dipole localization. It's very time consuming, sometimes subject to error. And a few years later, we developed this very powerful approach using fast fast time you know, for the for the language picture naming. We just present different pictures, you know, crocodile, airplane, baby, and apple to the screen. The subject just named those pictures and they're doing the MEG test. Now we can localize the MEG area. Of course, this task, you know, have many, many sources that generate it. And uh, with traditional dipole approach, you need to select very smart to select subset of channel. But that's, that's really, really subjective. In some cases, truly time consuming. But here, with, with fast fast though, you know, the machine give us all the information, the green error indicate, and the language production area of the naming. As in this case, you know, out of 10 pa patients with brain tumor, some of the tumor are very large, you can see that. 
The first A subjects, their left hemisphere, you know, show, you know, what we use radi radiation convention, the left hemisphere show on the right side of the, of the image. The left hemisphere, you know, dominate the Broca's area. Patient number nine, bilateral, both left and right tend to be, you know, co-activated for language. And the patient number 10 is lefty, and not surprised, his language and production area go to the right hemisphere. So his right hemisphere, right broker actually dominant. So, and that consistent with the, you know, neurophysiology with other, you know, and the uh, findings we have. It's just, again, two giant brain tumor patient, you know, the tumor distorted the broca's area drastically, but no problem with the best vesta, with the picture naming one, we can localize precisely language production area shown in the cross here, over here, the two patients. We also actually uh, localize uh, uh, as a group, you know, we have uh, many of those patients together. We can, we can smooth them out, co-register in the standard brain atlas, namely the Montreal Neurological um, uh, Institute coordinate, MNI 152, and now take a look as a group. You can see the green arrow highlight the broker's area, much stronger in left hemisphere than right hemisphere. So as a group, we have a left hemisphere dominant. The vast majority of patients are left hemisphere dominant. They are right-handed, no surprise. Another one that showed lateralization is the, the blue arrow, which is the, the vertex is here. So even though this task, we're targeting the broker's area, but the vertex is also light up. Again, you can see, and the left hemisphere vernix area much stronger than right hemisphere. The brown arrow shows the supramodular gyri tend to be have less dislateralization. And also these uh, angular gyri tend to have less dis and this lateralization, unlike vernix and broca's area. And also we go further, calculate the asymmetry coefficient, anything positive the right hemisphere dominant, anything negative, and left hemisphere dominant. So you can see vast majority of our sources called the right hemisphere, we see broker asymmetry, which is in the positive end. And we can also get a, the time, you know, the, the peak components uh, for the different area. For the vernix area, that happens actually early than the broker's area. So the vernix area light up first, and the language comprehension, then the the name the subjects, the broker's area, area actually produced language. You can see this Wernicke precede this uh, broker's area. Actually, broker's area had two peaks, small peak and major peak. And so that's the major uh, conclusions we have over there. And uh, so, uh, well, you know, I don't have any examples, but, you know, in the, in the past, I have, I also show some, um, you know, some, uh, yeah, the patient's report, but because the, the patient, patient's, you know, sensitive information, I bypass the staff. Uh, so next week, I'll be talking about um, MEG research projects. So today, I'm going to stop over here to see if there are any questions from the audience. Can ask any questions about this lecture and the source modeling about the uh, MEG clinical application. And so again, you know, we encourage people to work with us. You know, you have any research idea, please contact us. We'll be there to help you and to set up and work with you together. You know, set up the, the, the stimulus and run some uh, pilot tasks, you know, make sure you're happy with, with our design. We're gonna help, we're gonna help you training how, how to operate or train your staff how to operate MEG scanner for data acquisition. Um, again, the MEG is totally non-invasive, but still you need a safety training, not for, uh, for for your safety concern, but for the safety of the machine. You know, so uh, we have the you know you know things set up for data acquisition training, and the place contact us. And uh, uh, MEG is a powerful tool, as you can see, with a one millisecond temporal resolution. And also two to three millimeter spatial resolution is a nice combination. At least use the the vast package that uh, I'm the main developer. So use you can use uh, the the MEG 
livestock package for data analysis. If you're interested in other package, there's other package available. And uh, so let me see there's, I can show you some of the packages there. I have, uh, who might not have those ones ready, but uh, let me see. There's other packages. I, I might add that information back in uh, during my next lecture. So people interested to use other packages, feel free to use that one, but you know, I'll make sure you understand each hypothesis behind. Oh uh, yeah, the third party uh, software package. And then here's the one. And a few trip is a MATLAB based, you know, has a lot of nice uh, subroutine typically fun functional and the connectivity analysis. And uh, that's the field trip. And uh, before that, there's uh, and the MNE. &E. MNE is developed by Mari Hamalainen and uh, at the MGH. They have a strength of a very nice, you know, data input output. I In my package, I actually use their data input and output subroutine to read the data out of the you know, the .fib file. .fib format is the, you know, um, it's a specific format from the MEG. And uh, so I use the subroutine to read the data into my package. They also have a very nice l minimum norm and beamformer approach. And uh, they also brainstorm, you know, and uh, develop, now developed by um, John Mosher, Richard Leahy, now maintained by, uh, by you know, a 7 by 8 I was actually one of the early developer for their formal modeling, the boundary element code, and I was early users for that one. Uh, so that's the package you know, also freely available, MATLAB based, you know, have a lot of um, lot of double fit, you know, based you know, on the L2 minimum norm being former and so on. So those are the packages. And uh, I also have the package for third part package for uh, pre processing. Oh yeah, the another package, you know, like SPM by Carl Fristen's group, MATLAB based, and they also have their the in connection with FSL, you know, and, and they also have a nice you know, subroutine for boundary element uh, calculation, auto minimum norm, and the statistical analysis. That's the strength of that package. So yeah, I mean, you know, feel free to use those ones, you know, and the SPM, you know, M and E. Informing, I mean, not 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 the informing field trip, and the brainstorm. You know, and those the, the four package I recommend have different strengths over there and a different weakness as well. You know, of course, if you want to use my high resolution MEG package, you know, and the Vesto, I'm there to to help you. 